I'd like to briefly speak to Cindy Trevitt's comment that came in at 6.38 p.m. in the chat. Um, she writes, hi, Rick, thank you, but I'm afraid I still don't understand openness and opening and allowing or being opening. She, these are her quotation marks. What is opening? Me, my heart, my mind, and what am I opening to? Myself, this moment, my surroundings, the universe. It's difficult for me to go there without understanding as it feels defenseless. So I focus on beingness as it, as it, I can seem to grasp that, but maybe they are similar. Great stuff. So as context, anytime anyone, me or any other teacher source is offering a kind of suggestion or a pointing out instruction to be aware of something or to, you know, kind of nudge your mind stream in some kind of way, um, you know, in and of itself, we, sometimes that's useful and sometimes it's not. And sometimes it's, it's clear what the person's talking about. Other times it doesn't seem to make much sense. So uh, it's in that context then that I offer suggestions just over the course of a meditation rather than being totally silent, which we could do it. But I find that teaching online and also in my role here, I'm trying to draw your awareness into what could be some growing edges for you. Not quite within reach, but you know, you can kind of get there increasingly over time as, as the movement um, of your own gradual process of healing, growing, and awakening. So it's in that context then that, I'm, that I just kind of threw in this prompt around openness. Most fundamentally, we're speaking about an experience. So yes, it's helpful to understand it conceptually, but what's it feel like to be more open or more closed? What's it like to experience a process of opening in your body, in your heart, in your emotions, in your view, in your perceptions? We can all have a pretty clear sense of what that experience is, the process of opening, and we can all have a pretty clear sense of the process of closing, shielding, contracting. And neurologically, that sense of awareness opening or expanding in all directions associated with a sense of spaciousness. So these are just different prompts. And if they work for you, great. If they don't, out the door. But it might work for you, for you to have to, to bring awareness to, as many traditional teachers do, aspects of spaciousness, expansiveness, openness in your consciousness. And in the process of that, you may notice that there, that those support, those are factors, spaciousness, expansiveness, openness, including perceptually, those tend to support, and they have a neurological basis for it, coming into the present, relaxing the sense of self, and increasingly shifting out of doing into more being. So we have these qualities coming together, being, spaciousness, presence, openness, opening, any one of which we could focus on. And in the meditation here, I focused on that quality of opening and openness. So to answer the question, what is opening? We are opening. The mind is opening, the heart is opening, perception is opening. And in that opening, there is a releasing of guarding and contracting. Now, to do that opening, we have to help ourselves feel safe enough to do it, such as in a structured process of meditation, in a safe environment. There are certain situations in which we should close up. We should, you know, shields up, Scotty. Uh, but in this setting, we can explore that opening. And then to go to another level, which may not be within reach yet for you, but is this extra step is named traditionally, particularly in more Tibetan practices, we can start to experience um, being opening. And as we more deeply experience being opening, we start to recognize that 
all experiences are opening into awareness as they arise. So opening is an inherent feature. It's an inherent property. Uh, it's in the nature. All experiences are of the nature of opening. Whoa. Awareness has the nature of opening. Oh. The arising moment in reality, all everything that arises in object of reality has the nature of opening into the present as it changes into being something else. Whoa. And if you start to have a sense of abiding as this opening, whoa, it can really bring you into a deep intimacy with all that is in a very peaceful way that also support, supports open-heartedness in our relationships with others. So all of that is just an exploration, you know, relate to what you relate to and then see if you can build from there. But that's what I was trying to get at in that meditation. Okay. In my role as a teacher here in terms of meditations, I try to balance you know, foundational instructions, especially for people that are kind of new to this practice, so we kind of are on solid ground. And then also, especially for a lot of folks here who've been doing this for a while, um, what's the next opening? What's the next, see, opening again. What's the next possibility? What's the next becoming that's, you know, actually available to us, especially if we kind of name it and have some sense of it. And so I try to try to bring in some of that as well, particularly toward the end of a meditation. Hopefully that approach is helpful. Okay, that said, building on this quality of opening, I wanna talk about being open in the world and with other people without unnecessarily contracting with anxiety. Somebody else asked in the chat, um, what is needless anxiety? Maybe all anxiety is needless. I think it's appropriate to be anxious in certain situations. Someone comes at you initially in a threatening way, yeah, it's appropriate to be initially worried about that. It's, you know, maybe you're dealing with a health scare or maybe there's someone you care about a lot who's dealing with a health scare. Um, I got a private chat that came in um, having to do with someone who's recently gotten a pretty serious cancer diagnosis. And I, I feel for you, it's normal to have worry and anxiety arise. That could be said to be first darts, these normal reactions. You know, if a brick falls on your foot, of course, it's natural to experience physical pain. If you get a life-threatening um, diagnosis or a very worrisome diagnosis, it's natural to have feelings of dread or, or frozenness or shock or dismay or, or worry, uh, even panic or terror. These are, these are normal things that arise. The question is, are we adding unnecessary add-ons, reactions to those first starts of life? Are we contracting from other people when we don't actually need to contract from them? Are we getting preoccupied with anxious rumination about the future? Anxiety is typically anticipatory. Are we caught up in the future when in fact in the present, uh, we're still basically okay? Can we make effective plans? Can we take effective action? Can we assert ourselves effectively with other people without, as the Buddha put it, having fear invade us and remain? That's the key distinction. So for me, that's, that's the distinction here. When I talk about needless anxiety, I'm really referring to second dart anxiety, not a kind of inherent, understandable, initial biological reaction. And I'm talking about um, getting anxious in situations in which, yeah, there are challenges. Yes, there are threats. And we can cope with them. We can be vigilant about them. We can deal with them. We can be strong. We can have grit. We can enlist allies. We can tap into our inner resources. We can have a certain confidence. We can be determined. <laughs> no, <laughs> you shall not pass. Uh, we can have these qualities without having fear invade us and remain. 
So that's what I want to explore with you uh, in this talk I'm going to give right now. And I'm going to base this talk on some things I've been writing lately. So I hope you'll forgive me if my eyes divert from the camera to, to read some of this text with you. And then we'll open it up for discussion. And throughout, uh, let's keep focusing on the actual experience. What are you experiencing? And in particular, my focus will be on practical, realistic things you can do inside yourself to deal with this. Uh, later on, we'll get more into what you can do with other people, right? how you can push back against bullying of different kinds or establish more conditions of emotional safety in your important relationships. So get more into that stuff that happens between us and others, to be sure. But we're going to start tonight focusing on how we can deal with needless fear, needless interpersonal fear inside ourselves. So here we go. So we evolved. Let's start it right out. We're scared monkeys. We evolved to be fearful since overconfident monkeys did not live to see the sunrise back in Jurassic Park or back during the Stone Age in terms of early humans. Um, anxiety helped keep our ancestors alive. Consequently, though, we are vulnerable. We're vulnerable to being needlessly alarmed or sometimes maliciously manipulated, even intimidated by threats, both actual threats that we're overreacting to and by what could be called paper tigers, threats of different kinds that we think are real that are not so real. As I said, I'm going to focus on addressing this inside, our, inside ourselves, as I have the hiccups, I guess, and then later on we'll talk about um, things you know, with other people. Social anxieties are normal. I've had a lot of social anxiety. I'm kind of shy by nature. I'm like a friendly introvert. And growing up, wow, I had a lot of painful experiences around other people and I was not very skillful. So I was very awkward, which created a kind of a vicious cycle around other people. So I know what it's like to have significant social anxieties. Um, they're often subtle and mild. For example, you might step into a meeting Imagine a workplace meeting or any other kind of meeting. These are with people you know. You're coming into a group. They're not your enemies. They're not a bunch of haters there. And still, there could be a kind of watchfulness inside you, a restraint, a kind of carefulness in how you speak that comes more from subtle anxiety than reasonable prudence. Perhaps somebody disagrees with you in this meeting, Ugh! and you feel maybe uneasy, off balance, unprotected, unprotected. And then maybe later you worry about, hmm, what did others think about me? What did, they, how did they, what did they think about how I responded to the disagreement? Was I too irritated and pushy? Do they think I'm defensive? Do they think I'm like a weak milk toast? Hmm, what should I do next time? What should I do next time? What should I do next time? You know, right? Maybe kind of familiar, right? Feel free, by the way, in the chat to, if you want, Stay away from advising or commenting on or correcting or you know helping or criticizing other people, but you might want to focus yourself in the chat on what are examples for you of what you can come to see as needless fear around other people. When you get home, let's say, from this meeting, I'm going to go back now to another example. Let's say your teenage son is quiet and prickly as usual. You want to tell him, let's say, that the chilly distance between you feels awful. And you want to open your heart to him. You really do. But it, it just feels awkward. You know, it just feels like, don't do it today. You're afraid of making things worse. And maybe when you spoke from the heart when you were young, um, while growing up, it did not go well. And the fears reaching back into your childhood shadow and strengthen your fears today. So you say nothing yet again. As a parent, I know what this is like. And these are just the milder social anxieties. Consider stronger ones, such as common fears about um, public speaking, or other people getting angry, or being vulnerable, as Daniel Ellenberg talked about last week, or maybe fears of authority figures, you know, when the you know, you're driving along and suddenly the red and blue lights start flashing behind you and the police officer is there to give you a ticket or tell you that your brake light's out or something. Boom, 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 right? The heart starts beating. Um, 
maybe you have anxieties or fears about what you think other people are thinking about your appearance, your body, or what's it like to be around people who aren't like you, who don't have the same social situation or gender or bodiedness or um, you know ethnic identity or education or something like that. You know, do you feel okay? Can you feel okay around people who are not like you? You don't immediately, you know, look at them and go, oh, okay, you know, I belong to this tribe. No, it's a different tribe. What's it like to be around that? This vulnerability, we're just vulnerable. It's natural to be vulnerable to needless anxiety. This vulnerability to feeling threatened has effects at many levels, ranging from individuals, couples, and families, to schoolyards, organizations, and nations. Whether it's an individual who worries about the consequences of speaking up at work or in a close relationship, whether it's a family cowed by a scary parent, or a business fixated on threats instead of opportunities, or a country that's continually told from some sources that it's under assault by them, inside or outside. At all those scales, it's the same human brain that's reacting fearfully in each of those cases. Now, sometimes these fears are justified. Must be really clear. Nothing I'm talking about is rose-colored glasses or you know pie in the sky. Nuh -uh -uh -uh. Sometimes fears are justified. People in your life might actually want to pressure, dismiss, mistreat, hurt, or exploit you. For example, I've been in situations as a longtime therapist and family therapist in which a couple is going through a divorce and um, my client is a member of that couple who keeps thinking that the legal process uh, is kumbaya, you know, and actually doesn't realize that, no, this is a hostile uh, legal uh, conflict in which your ex, even though they once were your beloved and once you walked back down you know, the marital aisle with them, they are kind of out to get you or they don't really care about you in that warm-hearted, friendly, lover sort of way anymore. It's important to open our eyes. Sometimes people really are out to mess us over. It's important to see that, especially if you belong to a group of people that has been systematically discriminated against, harassed, assaulted, or even worse, yeah, it's important to have your eyes open. Uh, no doubt about it. And there's nothing I'm talking about here is about underestimating or discounting past and present um, threats uh, coming against you. It's really true. Also, think about human history. I've thought a lot about um, our tribal nature as hunter-gatherers dropped into a post, you know, an agricultural post-industrial world in which the surpluses that um, farming and herding make available have enabled vast concentrations of wealth and power, unlike anything we ever saw throughout almost all of our evolutionary history until just 10,000 years ago. And think about the recurring theme once those concentrations of wealth and power were enabled, the recurring theme throughout human history of authoritarian leaders revving up grievances against them, you know, you know, threatening them, threats from them, quote unquote, them, to increase their own power and wealth. I mean, yeah, it's prudent to be alarmed about this happening uh, inside your own country or in other countries, and especially if there's still time to do something about it. There's a place for that. Safety, it's arguably our most fundamental need. You know, live to see the sunrise. Eat lunch today, don't be lunch today. It's the most fundamental need of any animal, including us, and it's vital to be clear-eyed about threats and to be strong and skillful in dealing with them. Nothing that I'm talking about is about minimizing that. All this said, it's also true that very often our fears around other people are not really justified. Much of the time, those other people, honestly, they could hardly care less about whatever we did or said, or you know, we're usually just a bit player in their drama. Or if they do care at all, it's a passing thought. You know, eh, they have a kind of eh, side eye maybe eh, toward us, and then it's gone. They could hardly remember the next day. And even if the other person did react, oh, if your worst fears were confirmed, almost always you would handle it just fine eventually. And if there is something to deal with, you can deal with it. 
in a strong, clear, firm, self-respecting kind of way. I'm going to talk about the how of that later on, but I just want to point out that very often anxiety is added. It's added unnecessarily to our response to situations. Sometimes that add-on anxiety is helpful. It highlights threat, you know, wakes us up to, whoa, we got to really deal with something here. But usually it clouds our thinking. It adds needless suffering to yourselves and it fuels conflicts with others. So we can make two mistakes, two kinds of mistakes. On the one hand, we could have too little anxiety around others. You know, we can make those kind of mistakes. I've made that kind of mistake where I was overly innocent kind of childlike and trusting. And I thought, oh, they'll take care of me. Not. Or I underestimated the degree to which they're actually just looking for, out for number one, that other person themselves. We can make that kind of mistake. On the other hand, we can make the mistake of playing small around other people, of needless fear, of being overly cautious, overly con constrained, overly armored. Right? We can make either kind of mistake. Um, which kind of mistake is more common? I think it's the second one, actually, if for most people in most situations. And for sure, don't make the first kind of mistake. And in the rest of my talk here, I'm going to talk about dealing with that second mistake, needless anxiety stirred into the sauce of life, making it bitter. Okay, so how can we deal with it? How can we deal with it? And I'm scanning the chat comments coming in that seems, you know, relevant here. Okay, good. So, we can develop a habit of anxiety that's hard to budge. And one reason is that people can be anxious about not being anxious because they fear that, oh, if I'm not so anxious, I'm going to lower my guard, bingo, and that's when I got whacked previously in life. So, you know, it's all very understandable, but still the habit of anxiety kind of can trap us inside the bars of an invisible cage. So it's really good to realize that we can keep our eyes open, we can be vigilant, we can be open perceptually, one of the benefits of openness, to the threats coming at us from the horizon. You know, we can look 100 feet down the road when we're driving, not just 10 feet down the road. We can see it all without adding unnecessary anxiety to it. It helps also to be aware of the costs of needless anxiety and to tell the truth to yourself about those costs. What does it cost you to be unnecessarily withdrawn, removed from other people, fearful around them, overly inhibited around other people. How's that cost you? It's definitely cost me in this life to avoid situations in which I would kind of stick my neck out for fear of a shaming attack transferred from my childhood, you know, if I kind of stood up and spoke up. Um, when in fact, actually, there wouldn't come a shaming attack, or if it did, it would be a glancing blow. <laughs> it would be momentarily ugh, uncomfortable, but it wouldn't fundamentally stop me from going forward. What's it cost you to be unnecessarily anxious? You know, and then really decide in your heart, hey, December 15th, 2021, in the Western calendar system, what do you want to do about needless anxiety? in the remaining days and years of your own life. I think about this deep, deep teaching of the Buddha that I've quoted again and again. One is wise, he said, who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. What would it be like to grow into this way of being for you? You know, that will motivate you to take the steps that now I'm gonna talk about. You can bring mindful awareness regularly to how you appraise threats, especially recognizing whether you're overestimating them. So you might think about the things that you're worried about, which basically boils down to three things. The odds of a bad event. Second, if the bad event occurred, the consequences, the damage from it, how big would, it be, how big would the damage be? How uncomfortable would it feel? What might be the consequences, et cetera? And then third, in the unlikely event that there is significant damage, how could you cope with it? How could you cope with it? This is a nice structured way to examine 
various worries or fears. And you can even do it in writing based on things that you're worried about, including fears of what might happen if you spoke from your heart with another person. So bringing mindful awareness to how you appraise threats, recognizing whether you're overestimating them is really good. Also, are you underestimating your resources, right? Your resources for dealing with whatever's happening around you and also for dealing with your own reactions. We typically overestimate external threats and we underestimate um, our internal resources for dealing with them. So can you put in a correction factor, right? This kind of mindfulness and stepping back from your habits of your own mind can be incredibly useful. And it's actually at the heart of cognitive behavioral therapies uh, for anxiety of different kinds, okay? Also, think about your turbochargers, your inner turbochargers from the life that you've had, especially in childhood. Um, what's been scary, threatening, even traumatic that you've experienced so far? And based on that, how have you learned to deal with threats and manage your feelings of vulnerability and anxiety? These learnings probably were helpful at the time. They got you through. You had to do it. It made sense at the time. All right. But that's what happened when you were five years old or 50 years old, and now you're 60. Hmm, you know, uh, these learnings, these ways of being, these turbochargers are now lodged in your body. They're lodged in habits of how you interpret things, the emotional reactions to them, and the impulses and actions you take in regard to them. Uh, understanding these turbochargers, is incredibly helpful. They take what's happening around you that's actually like a two or a three on the zero to 10 scale of yuckness and brrr, rev it up. So it feels like a seven or eight inside you. And as you gradually recognize that kind of turbocharger process, then more and more, even though it's arising in you, you're detached from it. You understand it. You understand that it's revved up by a turbocharger. For me, for example, um, you know, I, Help, it helped me a lot to realize, whoa, you know, I learned to be very prickly about control or criticism coming at me, which I've then had to work with in my marriage over the many years. Um, and I realized that, you know, I grew up in a controlling and critical environment. So I'm kind of prickly about it. Uh, so I manage that prickliness and I kind of sort out, all right, someone, let's say my wife, is indeed being a little critical, a little controlling, maybe rightfully so, deservedly so, okay. But then it hits this turbocharger of reactivity in me. Recognizing that turbocharger, I can disidentify. I can step back from the reactions. I feel them. I try to have some mindfulness and compassion for myself as I feel them, but I don't have to identify with them. I don't have to believe them because I can understand, oh, there's a turbocharger there. Um, you know, also as you recognize the turbocharger, you find yourself talking with yourself in a good way. Why self-talk? Very useful. For example, you might say to yourself, I don't know, depending on the situation, this is not junior high school. He is not my dad. What they said, maybe, was critical, but it was not a horrible attack. I have not been totally rejected by this other person or group, even though it might feel like that. Just because I feel something doesn't mean it's true. These hurt feelings, you might say to yourself, are mainly old emotional memories transferred into the present. They're not based on what is true here and now. That kind of self-talk based on a growing understanding over time, including very common sense understanding without doing a bunch of therapy of your own inner turbochargers is really helpful. You might make a little list of your turbochargers and um, you know, uh, regard them with compassion and understanding. They served a great function for a while, but now they're causing trouble. They're creating unnecessary anxiety and reactivity, and increasingly, you can disengage from them and gradually turn down their volume. All right. Also, be mindful of anxiety around other people, especially subtle forms of unease, concern, tension, nervousness, or worry. Tune into your body, that little jump in heart rate or funny feeling when you're around other people. You know, it, this 
anxiety can really be running in the background with other people. And yet, even though it's in the background, it can really, really affect us, kind of primes us to feel overly threatened, especially if anything, you know, happens. So I have a suggested practice for you. You can do it with anybody, especially someone you know that cares about you. So you know rationally, okay, this person cares about me, they're a decent person, okay? And then when you're with that person, and try to adapt my suggestions, you can do a little deliberate experiential practice with yourself, kind of a training with yourself that will help you becoming less and less anxious around people. Here you are with this person, maybe feeling, you could be feeling a little uh, vulnerability, especially as you open up to them, but you can say to yourself, I know you're not going to attack me. I know you're not going to attack me. Saying that to yourself around this other person and then see if you can believe it. See if there can be a softening in you related to saying that so that you feel safer, less anxious. What's it like to feel unthreatened around someone who's truly not threatening? Wow. That's actually kind of hard to sustain often. So it's a very interesting growing edge in your practice to help yourself feel unthreatened and undefended around someone that truly it's okay to to be that way around. You can even go to the next level, talking to yourself in this little exercise that I'm walking you through here. You could even say to yourself with regard to this other person, you know, even if you did, Fill in the blank. Even if you did kind of ignore me, which would be hurtful. Even if you were a little snippy. Even if you were irritable because maybe you've had a hard day. Whatever. Even if you did kind of criticize me in some way, I would still be okay in the core of my being. I might feel uncomfortable. It might be unpleasant. I'm not looking for it. And still, I would be okay in the core of my being. In other words, I don't need to be afraid of getting afraid. I don't need to be afraid of being uncomfortable or upset or rattled by another person. I don't need to be afraid of that experience. I'm not wishing for it, but it would, I'd be okay. I won't die. I won't be destroyed. I won't be abandoned. I won't be unloved. I won't fall apart. You know, I'll be okay, even if the dreaded experience were to occur. That's great to rest in that and to keep yourself resting in that knowing of okayness, even if something challenging happens. You can let the truth of that sink in. Okay, so let's. Let's take it another step. Say to yourself, you know, I can take care of myself around you. Not like I can take care of myself, I can hit you back. No, it's just anxiety is about the future. If something happens in the future, I can handle it. I have a lot of social skills. I've been meditating a while. Um, you know, I'll figure something out. Maybe I, what I'll say initially won't be the right thing, but I'll figure it out. I'll muddle my way forward. Well, I, you know, I can dance with you. I can repair here. I can take care of myself, even if something bad happens. Just knowing that gives you a real important feeling of confidence. And the, the key, of course, is to believe what you're saying to yourself and to really, really, really help it sink in. This, in this way, you can afford to feel increasingly open with other people. I'm dropping my arms here. Undefended, unguarded, uh, with people with whom this is appropriate, of course, which probably is a lot of people in your life, including some casual acquaintances, just to keep reminding yourself, you know, um, you're probably not going to hurt me. If you do, it won't destroy me and I can take care of myself. That's really good. Also, 
to say to yourself with regard to that other person, I wish you well. That too is really powerful to know that in you, this this really supports confidence and relieves social anxiety to trust in your own sincerity, to trust in your own good intentions. Uh, It's great to have that bone deep feeling of your own good intentions, your own good qualities, your own natural caringness, your own inherent goodness when you're around other people. So that, you know, even if, yeah, they see something that could be more polished in you. I got some feedback earlier today about how I could have done something a little better in my work. It was it was fair. It was accurate. Uh, it was in the context of doing a complicated, difficult thing. And <laughs> it's impossible to do everything about that perfectly, but okay, I got it. It was a good takeaway. I'm going to learn from that in the future. You can know that you learn. You can trust yourself that you're a learner, that you're someone who will take input, sort through it to find what's useful and accurate about it, clean up the mess as appropriate, make amends if it's at all appropriate, and in, you know implement correction inside yourself as appropriate, and then keep on going. Knowing that about yourself can sure help you be more con- more confident and comfortable around other people and less fearful. You know, it's possible to be open, patient, present, at ease around other people, even people who are kind of challenging. You can be like a space, whoosh, that their stuff, their anger, their demands, their critiques, their all-knowing certainty about the way it is, whoosh. You can be a space that that kind of passes through without having to fight with it. You can be with them unafraid, unhurried, unpressured as you receive whatever they are as it passes through you while you strongly and confidently remain. It's wonderful to release needless fear around other people. Okay, so I see lots of comments coming in. Uh, So many things, I just am not gonna be able to speak to it all. I will read everything that you send me, but I won't be able to respond to a lot of it. Um, I see 92 new messages here. (laughs) Okay, great. Um, Let's just see if there's something that's come in recently. Very good. This is great. I can see the people are really tracking it. I can see good, uh, Good support, good um, you know responses to other people. Uh, I think uh, Ken made a comment here at seven seventeen um, that I just thought is really relevant and wise. It's both about a particular situation as well as something more broadly. And I'm actually taking this on board myself for some of my some of my own issues. Ken writes and. You know, it's, it's publicly available. As a gay child raised in a conservative Southern environment in the Roman Catholic Church, I felt great freedom from being labeled a sick sinner when I realized that they were not qualified to judge me. They were not qualified to judge me. Wow. You know... Um, Oof. Just imagine rewinding and taking yourself back to being a little kid. For me, you know, being very young in school, picked last for sports teams because I was young and scrawny, um, and wore glasses, you know, not yet very athletic. Um, you know, and to look around that group of other kids or those kids in junior high school or, you know, people you work with or, you know, your first marriage, maybe someone who really mistreated you. Um, and just look at them and go, you know, you're not qualified to judge me. You're not. You're not qualified to judge me and to really feel that. Wow. Thank you, Ken. What a freedom. Um, yeah, that's great. You know, as Ken goes on, they weren't able to get heterosexuality figured out correctly. So there was no way <laughs> they were competent to comment on my intrinsic nature. Wonderful comment. Thank you, Ken. All right, let's see. Maybe one person. I see Catherine. I think there was another person who also had their hand up. Catherine, we've spoken before, so I'm going to be a little quick with you, okay? I'm going to ask you to unmute, 
And um, as usual, you know the drill. Short, succinct questions of general interest. Great. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, great talk. And I've been working actively on this for the last few months, um, yeah. making lots of headway. So the Good. thing I wouldn't mind your feedback on is there's a couple scenarios, so whichever. One is inconsistent people. I find really triggering because I have, you know, preoccupied parents, like now you see them, now you don't, all or nothing back. This is still a hard one I find to overcome mm -hmm. the okay. mindset with. And the other is competitive. People being competitive is a hard one to. Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder if you have thoughts on those. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. So just to kind of quickly unpack it for other people. Um, so here we are. And we're, we're designed to be affected by how other people are through evolution. Uh, our closest uh, animal relatives, chimpanzees, they're actually not that affected by other chimps, even though they're very, very social compared to many, many other animals. Um, humans evolved to be highly affected by others in their small band. So it's actually really helpful to kind of give yourself a break and to realize, of course I'm affected. Of course I'm affected, especially if I have a history uh, around people who are inconsistent growing up, or I have a history around people who are competitive with me and they're, they're kind of pushing for one up, which inherently means pushing me one down, right? So, you know, just that alone can actually be kind of helpful. It's like accepting our reactions, understanding them, kind of seeing them as common humanity, normalizing them. That, that actually can be weirdly, it's like doing jujitsu with your own reactions initially. So that's a good place to start. Second, we can ask ourselves, what's the actual material harm to me of them being that way? Often, there's no material harm. They're saying those things or they're just doing that sort of thing. They're being a way that bugs us and we're kind of often transferring our reactions to people from our childhood. But in terms of our core needs, our priorities in life, what really matters, going on living, being able to pursue our careers, being able to be with people who are, who are in fact consistent and are not trying to always beat us or win with us, you know, our fundamental interests are not being disturbed often by other, pe by other people doing their thing. And I think that's really helpful. And what can sometimes be a takeaway is to realize, you know, I've gotten overly invested with that over there. I'm caught up in their inconsistencies or I'm caught up in their, let's say, competitiveness, their subtle forms of domination, maybe or you know, possessiveness, I'm getting caught up in that. And actually, I should increasingly get out of their movie and focus on what my own material interests, my own direct substantive life priorities. Kind of getting out of that movie and focusing on your movie, including especially spending more and more time with people who are better to be with for you. Right. So these are points that I'm sort of allowed to have these boundaries. <laughs> yeah, that I've would been be surrounded way. by so many people like this. I guess I feel like, oh, is it me? I should ride with this. I should accept people are never are inconsistent or, but yeah, it bugs me. So I'm trying to be honest, it bugs me. So yeah, what I mean, I think what I'm saying so far is, is relevant to you personally and, and probably to people in general. And part of what happens is, is that we, we uh, shrink the size of the relationship. I talk a lot about that. You know, if you're with someone, and the truth is I've had people that I thought I could trust deeply uh, in terms of business and they would eventually pay me what they owed me. No, they were re revealed over time, nope, to be untrustworthy. But this particular person I'm thinking about is a fantastic body worker. And I could trust him to do good work on my body, physical therapy kind of stuff. And that was it. And I, you know, we were not going to be friends, but, you know, I could let him work on my body. So we, we start to realize that with certain people, maybe the scale of the relationship is a simple, pleasant lunch once a year. No big deal, catching up, 
no deep investments. You know, we're not making ourselves dependent upon them or vulnerable to them, right? Um, all that said, uh, I really do want to flag the ways in which we can um, get caught up in, in things that actually don't harm us directly. And the harm is inside our own mind, all right? That's what we're caught up in. Uh, okay, great, Catherine. But I, I can see just from our conversation, you're doing great. Keep on going. Keep on going. You know. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Jung had this phrase, withdraw the cathexis. It's like this kind of psychoanalytic term. We give others energy. You know, we we give them, you know, the expression, right? Rent free space inside our head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if only we could charge for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Okay, thank you. Gloria Rodriguez. So you'll be the last person. Where are you, Gloria? There you are. And <clears throat> then we'll wrap up. Hi there. So I've asked you to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, sorry, works. sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's no worries. Because I, I, yes, I was, I was handling to, do you listen to me? Yes. Okay. It's because I was trying even to send you the message. What I was going to ask has been great. Um, and I was saying is um, when you were talking about this and taking the space or mm. taking the space, let that don't be affected. I am someone who is affected all the time, all the yeah. time. And um, so I, I want to learn more about that, ah. <laughs> especially with my daughter that she's bipolar. Yeah. Yeah. And when she calls me, mommy, 100%, 100%. You, you cannot do anything, but that's 100%, but it's, it's, yeah. uh, I have to learn more. <laughs> oh, well, so thank you for saying that. And um, it, it's interesting, some people are so closed off that causes a lot of suffering. Other people are so open. That can also cause suffering. And to me, I'm, I'm hearing you as someone, both as a person and as a big hearted mother, you have a really big heart and you're really affected, right? By what's happening around you. Also, technically, some people have just a temperament in which they are very open to sensation and perception and stimuli both external stimuli and internal stimuli, and they can feel kind of flooded by it. So what to do about that? I'll give you a couple of tips, if I could, based on um, brain science, actually. Two basic tips, which can also help us be less anxious in situations when we're around other people. And then I'll, I'll finish up tonight. So the first tip is to tune into the internal sensations of your body including the very simple sensation of air coming in and going out as you breathe. You could be listening to your daughter on the phone. Maybe you're with other people. You're hearing what they're saying. You're, you're hearing what they're saying, but you also have, it's like having one leg on a certain place, even while the other leg is moving around. One leg of attention is with the internal feeling of breathing. And if you get distracted from that, that's okay. Come back to it. Come back to that internal sensation of breathing. That neurologically will heighten the sense of nonverbal processes because it's just sensation and will also highlight the sense that you're okay. Your body is still okay as, as you breathe and it will give you a stronger sense of me in comparison to you, to that other person. Just that, awareness of internal sensations of breathing. Really, really effective. Second tip, based on how the brain works, which can also really help with people around whom we're, we're anxious, um, is to imagine or take a greater sense of distance from them. There's interesting research that shows that the more physical distance we imagine from something that's unpleasant, like a annoying and ringing bell, the more physical distance we imagine, the less upset we get by it and the less stressed we get by it. So I do things sometimes with other people where even though they're kind of close, I, I imagine that they're far away or I imagine that there's an invisible wall like a thick wall of glass 
between me and that other person, even though they're there. Um, you know, if uh, if they're not physically in your face right there, you can imagine that you're looking at them through the wrong end of a telescope. So they're very small and very far away. Just that physical distancing is a good um, technique um, that you can use inside your own mind. So those are two I wanted to suggest. There's more I could talk about it. In my book, uh, Buddha's Brain, I talk about equanimity and being able to build up a greater sense of kind of calm and boundaries when we're around other people. You might want to take a look at the material. Yeah, Buddha's brain. That was that was my sec that was my second book. Uh, so yeah, check that out. Um, and yeah, and just know over time you'll get better and better at this, and you'll find that sweet spot, kind of like we did in the meditation, where we can be open while being grounded and present in our own in our own space, right here, right now, without being flooded. It's maybe I am tra practicing qigong now. Oh great! And then that's it. So it's taking the energy and. Let it right. with the energy so we don't, it's a little bit. Of, and yeah. again, I wrote you, but I want to say to everybody your email about the 12 good things yeah. are great because, oh. yes. Oh, thank you, Gloria. You're really kind. Yeah, yeah. And you could trust in your good heart. You know, you've given already so much, obviously. Um, it's okay at this stage of life to take more for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. Merry Christmas. Hey, Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> very, very good. Okay. Uh, on that celebratory note, yay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to wish you all well. And uh, I thought this we covered a lot of good ground. I will go back and read the chats. So how about we bring it officially to a close? And uh, know that you have my good wishes. You really do. 